In this section, let's discuss buffer overflows. We'll start with discussing how memory works in the computer, and we'll see how that applies to your applications. And then we'll take a look at a quick example. It's sometimes difficult to demonstrate a buffer overflow intentionally. Many languages these days try to prevent you from causing this. So, But I will show you an example using C Sharp a little bit later. So first of all, you need to understand inside the computer we have memory, right? And that memory is allocated in a certain way. So what we're really talking about here, something called the stack, the stack is just a way to allocate memory. So we set aside memory as scratch space for a particular thread of execution. And it's always reserved in last in, first out order, which means that the last piece of information we put on the stack is the first piece of information that we're going to take off the stack. When the thread finally completes, when it exits, then the entire stack is reclaimed and it's made available for some other thread. Uh, but this is all handled usually by the operating system or some runtime, depending on what programming language you're using. Local variables and methods tend to lie in the stack. It varies again from programming language to programming language, but this is most commonly how it's done. So you see we've got on our diagram to the right there. It's a very difficult diagram, isn't it? We've got the stack with the memory growing down, and we've got free memory for the stack or the heap underneath. So let's talk about the heap. So the heap is memory set aside for dynamic allocation. In other words, there's no real pattern to how it's allocated or deallocated. And there's typically one heap per application, not per thread. So remember, an application could have several threads, you know, perhaps anywhere from tens to thousands, who knows, depending on how complex that application is. So the heap, usually it grows with instance variables and objects. Those would tend to live on the heap. And it grows up, if you want to think of it this way, from the lowest levels of memory, lowest register of memory, to the highest registers. So that free memory in between is used for both the stack and the heap. And then once the application exits, that's when the heap is freed up for that particular application. All right, so in this example of a buffer overflow, I had to contrive quite a few things just to get it to work for you here. Um, because again, most modern programming languages attempt to stop or block this type of poorly written code. All right, so you can see this is a C-sharp program here, buffer overflow example, and it's short and sweet. Um, our standard main right here with our string arguments, and we have a method called crack me because that's the one that's going to be written poorly, and that's the one that's going to be vulnerable to a buffer overflow. So now if you look at this method here, and again, it's not necessary to be an expert in C, C++, C Sharp to just kind of get a basic understanding of what's happening here. All right, we have this method called crack me, and I had to mark it as unsafe uh, simply to get the compiler in Visual Studio to let me put it together. So you'll notice it's in a try catch block here. Essentially, a, in C Sharp, the try catch block is for any time we think we have some code that could possibly throw an error. And that's typically what would happen. The common language runtime in C Sharp would detect that there's a problem here, which we're going to walk through in just a second here. So you can see that we are setting up a pointers here, integer. All right, you'll see it represents a 32-bit signed integer. All right. And this special keyword stack allocation says that I want to put this array of integers all right, into the uh, stack rather than where it would normally fall perhaps in the heap here. I'm forcing it into the stack just in case. Now you'll see it says again, so I've set another integer as i, and it has, it's going to be 36. That's where it's going to start. So we're going to count down from 36. So while i is greater than 0, we move this pointer and we just keep filling in zeros into each slot of this array. All right, so we just keep incrementing the pointer one time and moving into the next item in the array. We're also counting down, see, so this is a special decrement from 36. So the first time through we go 36, 35, 34, 33, 32. Well, what's the problem? 36 is obviously more than the 32 slots I have in the stack. So essentially, I'm going to overflow that area. I'm going to overflow the buffer, right? Now, what would happen normally without this unsafe and without all this, I, one, I wouldn't be able to really write this code. Two, it would catch the exception and throw a little message for me, exception caught. 
there's an error. Oh no! So when it's finally over, we just have a nice little message here, finished buffer overflow attack All right, at the very end. So I had to do a few things on this. Uh, on the project itself, I had to change some of its properties. And you'll notice in the build property, I had to tell it I want to allow unsafe code. Otherwise, uh, the Visual Studio compiler here would have said, no, I don't think that's appropriate. Uh, and would have simply said, nope, can't do that, sorry. Uh, you need to go fix this. I won't build this piece of software for you. Then the other thing I need to do is when I actually build this and run this, I am not going to tell it to uh, go through with debugging. You'll see I have start debugging and start without debugging. In other words, don't look at it. Leave it alone. Now, if you're familiar with programming, you're very familiar with these steps. If you're not familiar with programming at all, again, it's not necessarily that you need to be an expert to get a general idea of what's happening here. We're pushing too much into the space allocated on the stack. That's all we're doing. So when we run this, what's going to happen when I say to start this program, now this is a console program, so it should open up in something that looks very much like a DOS window. So I run this and you see, oh no, look at that. The system says it stopped working. I crashed the thread. Basically, I crashed the application because I gave more memory than it knew what to do with. Now, so this is Windows throwing an error and it's checking to see if it can find a solution for the problem. Uh, what I am not going to do, so it says problem caused the program to stop working correctly. Windows will close the program and notify you if a solution is available. So if someone could send data to your application and push it beyond that. If you're not filtering your inputs and making sure that no one's, what if it was a variable, so we got to pick how big that counter was for i. Notice, remember it was, so I'm gonna just close the program right now. Let's press any key to continue to get out of my running application. So you'll see, what if this i, rather than a static 36 that's programmed in here, what if this was something that we allowed our user to input how many times to go through this loop? And if we didn't filter this, what do we need to do? We need to put some sort of check, some sort of verification to make sure it's below whatever we've allocated for P. Otherwise, we'd have a big error on our hands. So the simple way to prevent buffer overflows is one, write good code, and two, filter your inputs. Prevent, you know, verify the data that you're getting from the users. Now in this case, what a user can do if that was, let's say this was an input variable, someone could actually input this number, they could essentially perform a denial of service on this application. What if this was a web server? What if this was, oh, I don't know, a database? And they figured out how to push the data and jump through our limits on our inputs, on our buffers. Then they crash the data, they've given, they've crashed the application, and now we end up with a denial of service for other legitimate users who want to get to our application. So this is a short and sweet demonstration of a buffer overflow. You could actually just literally cut and paste this code. I've borrowed code from many places before here. This is you know a very simple, straightforward code on how to run through this here. So thankfully, most programming systems and most programming languages, most integrated development environments like Visual Studio here are watching for these things and trying to prevent them. Not to say that you can't do it. You can definitely write uh, code that will allow a buffer overflow, but it's difficult to look through. And so how do we, also how do we prevent this? Code walkthroughs, testing and testing and testing. Anytime you develop an application and that application has a certain range for input, you want to develop at least four tests. One at each end within the range and one at the upper and the lower end of the ranges, and one at each end outside the range. So for example, if your legitimate range of numbers was two through 10, then you would test one test at two, one test at 10, one test at the value one, and one test at the value 11. And you better hope you get an error at the one and 11, otherwise things could be dangerous. So this is just a brief taste of buffer overflows. If you're interested in more, you know, go take a programming class. Go learn C, C++, C Sharp, Java, and I'm sure you'll get a lot more information about buffer overflows. For the exam, it's simply recognition. You don't need to be able to write out a buffer overflow code. You don't need to be a programmer for the exam.